Yes, Brother Anko. We can start. Shall we start, sir? Yes, yes. A gleeful morning to you all. I feel extremely honored to host this team, the Science Academy's virtual lecture workshop on new horizons in biodiversity and bioresources organized by the department of botany st joseph's college Trichy, and sponsored by indian academy of sciences bangalore indian national science academy new delhi and the national academy of sciences allahabad true to his noble ideal pro bono et vero for the good and the true St. Joseph's College has always upheld the radiate goodness and truth in its endeavor to impart quality in higher education. This educational event has been ensuring our thousands of truly educated persons physically and intellectually thus for what is best in education. So, on behalf of the Department of Botany, I extend my sincere gratitude towards the, the management for giving us ample support and splendid opportunity to conduct this virtual lecture workshop. Hence, at the outset, let us begin the Science Academy's virtual lecture workshop on new horizons in biodiversity and bioresources with God's abundant blessings through prayer. God of all that exists, we give you thanks for providing us with the conducive environment to live a comfortable life. You gave us this universe filled with your gifts. Help us to reverence all of your creation. Respecting the rights of all species and the integrity of the elements so that all creations may live with you for all eternity. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. A reading from the scripture. But ask the animals, and they will teach you, or the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, or let the fish of the sea inform you. Which of all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. Dear Lord, we thank you for this beautiful world with, the, with its amazing variety of animals and plants. May we never forget that we are stewards of your creations and that we hold it in trust for future generations. Help us to respect the Earth's rich diversity and to share with others and all living creatures in responsible ways. Amen. At this gracious moment, I now call upon our beloved head of Dr. S. or Sendil Kumar to address the gathering with his welcome note. Please, sir. Uh, thank you, brother. Uh, greetings in his holy day. Very good morning to all of you. The intrinsic value of biological diversity and of the ecological, genetic, social, economic, scientific, educational, cultural, recreational, and aesthetic values. And its importance are to be taken care properly 
for the better management of biological resources and biodiversity for the welfare of human beings for better and healthier as well as peaceful living on earth for our future generations. So due to this importance, the Department of Botany is happy to inaugurate its INSA sponsor another virtual lecture workshop for the benefit of younger generations. Academic virtual lecture workshop on, on new horizons in biodiversity and bioresources sponsored by Indian Academy of Sciences Bank. It's my tremendous pleasure and honor for me to welcome our Reverend Dr. M. Araksami S.J., our beloved principal of this great institution. Our principal has his previous experience as a principal of Loyola College Chennai, has delivering positive results against challenges obtained through several awards and recognition. Reverend Father Principal, having his great ideology and determination, our college achieve, achieves greater height in recent years. On the behalf of the organizing committee and National Academy of Sciences, I bite hearty welcome you, Father. Welcome you, Father. Uh, Professor Joseph Bakiraj, INSA senior scientist, University of Agriculture Sciences, Bangalore, is known for sympathetic fun fungus of this virtual lecture workshop. Professor is holding many academic achievements in the field of plant microbe interactions, in particularly arbuscular microbial fungi. On the behalf of our college management, the Department of Botany, and on my own behalf, I cordially welcome you, professors. Along with Professor Pakiraj, other expertise in the field of botanical sciences, and Dr. M. Sanjapa, former director of Botanical Survey of India, Professor Rao, insider scientist, and Professor Sivana, former professor of Botany, Delhi University, all here. So they will share their experience during the session. So on the behalf of the College of Management Department, and my own behalf, I welcome.
the Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore, also business, which is, is mainly meant for undergrads and undergraduate teachers. And it, it, all of us know that it also of kinds, which is of rated very high. And um, later, this work was done by only the Bangalore Academy till 2006. But later, in 2007, the Indian National Science Academy, New Delhi, and the National Academy of Sciences, Allahabad, also joined the Indian, uh, the Indian National Science Academy, Bangalore. Now, all the three academies jointly sponsor these programs. I will very briefly tell you about these three programs. Coming to the lecture workshop, any college, any university in the country can apply to the academy for organizing two or three days lecture workshop. It can be on any subject. It can be on physics, engineering, chemistry, agriculture. It can be on any topic. And um, so it is meant mainly for students. Some teachers can also apply, can join, but it is mainly meant for students. And uh, so when you have a lecture workshop, the convener of the lecture workshop must be a fellow of the academy. That is mandatory. And at least 50% of the persons must be uh, fellows of the academy and well known in that particular area of the lecture workshop. So that is how we are here, the four resource persons and um, who are experts, supposed to be experts in this particular area of bioresource and uh, biodiversity. And um, so far, I can say that about 300 such lecture workshops have been organized by the academy, the three academies all over the country. Coming to the second category, the refresher course. And the refresher course is mainly meant for teachers. Okay. So when any university or, or college can apply to the, uh, to the academy and ask that they are interested in organizing a refresher course, it should be on a specific topic. This should be very, very specific. For example, taxonomy or something with plant micro interactions, very specific topics. And so it should be, it is advertised. And the, uh, sorry, any, any, any college or any teacher can apply for this. And it is uh, for two weeks duration, usually 14 days. And the other thing is, it should represent teachers from all over the country. Okay. And maximum intake is 30. Suppose there are only 25 teachers, probably the local organizer takes some PhD students or postdoctoral fellows from the nearby places. And um, here, the thing is, in the morning, we have lectures and afternoon, we have practicals. That is so that the teachers get the hands-on uh, uh, achievements in the particular subject. So this is very, very useful when they go back to the respective college and teach the students. Okay, as far as the statistics is concerned, I think about uh, 300 such refresher courses on various topics have been organized. But I have to end, say something. Maximum requests come in physics. So I think people in other subjects should also apply for this. Coming to the summer research fellow <clears throat> research fellowship, suppose we have a student or a teacher interested in a particular area of research. Let us say nitrogen fixation by Rhizobium. I'm just taking an example. And there is a scientist working in uh, Nehu, Shillong, on this particular area. And he's supposed to be a specialist in that particular area. So the student, and there is an advertisement by the academy for the summer research fellowship, which comes usually in the month of October. And, he, and it is advertised in resonance and it also uh, in current science and other media. So one can apply for this and there's a lot of competition of this. I say that for a particular subject, sometimes even microbiology, we get so many thousands of applications. So it's a lot of competition now. One has to apply and then see whether they will be able to get the fellowship. So if he or she is selected, 
for the summer research fellowship. The candidate is paid, is paid travel grants from, say, Trichy to Shillong and back. And it is for two, week, uh, two months. So two months stay and accommodation, food, etc. stay care of. And for that, there is an honorarium that is paid to the candidate. And I think it is around 10,000 rupees if it is a student and 15,000 rupees per month if it is a teacher. And so this is a very good opportunity for a young teacher or a student to go and then spend two months with a specialist in that particular area of research. For the past two years, um, the academy has introduced about 10% reservation to teachers and students coming from certain states in the Northeast, Jammu, Kashmir, Bihar, and Chattis. So this is reserved for them, 10% reservation. And it is called as Focus Area Science Teachers Fellowship. And another thing I would like to mention here is for the Summer Research Fellowship, the preference is given to teachers and students coming from smaller places. That means smaller towns, rural areas, a student from New Delhi, Mumbai, Hyderabad, Bangalore, Chennai get his preference. The people coming from smaller areas will get the best preference. So they said usually the advertisement comes in the month of October. The selection is done in the month of uh, December, and the candidate will be uh, informed by the by February, January, February, so that they can join in during the summer vacation. So these are the three main programs uh, sponsored by the academy. And I'm sure that today's program here at uh, St. Joseph's College Chichi will be of use to the students and young teachers who are participating in it. Wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for briefing us well about the workshop. May I now request the person of magnificence and resilience who sculpts St. Joseph's College into betterment and possible, our highly cherished principal, Reverend Father Arakirsami Xavier S.J., to felicitate the gathering with his inaugural address. Welcome, Father. Thank you. Dear esteemed Professor Joseph Vakiraj, Professor Raghavendra Rao, Professor Sivana, dear Vice Principal, dear Dean, dear HOD, dear Professor Francis Xavier, the Organizing Secretary of this workshop, dear faculty members, my dear scholars, and students and friends, good morning to you all. At the outset, I would like to congratulate the department for organizing this high profile workshop today for the welfare of the students and the scholars. And I also congratulate them for taking up this initiative, particularly for this topic, new horizons in biodiversity and bio resources. As you all know, the topic is very timely and very relevant. The whole world feels a need of it. It is a need of the hour. That is why they have taken up this topic in collaboration with the support of the premier science institutions in India. I also would like to thank all institutions who continuously support our college particularly the Department of Botany. I'm sure the Botany Department will excellently complete this process as they have been doing very well in the past. And I would like to appreciate once again the Department of Botany for their excellent work in the research. The Botany Department has been in the forefront in research in many areas. Of course, it 
it was one of the departments which brought laurels to our college my dear students and scholars the the topic they have taken up is very well known which insist on the respect of earth's rich biodiversity of course every one of us are proud of the for this biodiverse nature and at the same time every one of us have the duty and task and of course along with the responsibility to protect this biodiversity with our bio resources this workshop surely will sense the students and scholars of course also as the participants and all of you and i'm sure all the distinguished resource persons scholars will enlighten our participants on this topic because this is a high profile virtual workshop so i would like to once again thank each and every one of you dear professors the distinguished uh, scholars who are going to contribute on this topic thank you very much thank you thank you very much sir thank you thank the pillar of support every time possible with this we have come to an end of the inaugural ceremony of science academy's virtual lecture workshop on new horizons in biodiversity and bioresources so i once again extend my hearty welcome to one and all to begin the workshop i hand over the session to dr t francis xavier assistant professor department of botany st joseph's college trichy the organizing secretary of the workshop over to you sir respected father principal respected convener of uh, this uh, workshop dr dj bike raj respected professor dr rao dr sivana and dr sanjappa respected vice principal reverend dr arulanandam respected dean dr sagay satish our beloved head of the department of botany dr s sandil kumar faculty members of our department and the neighboring colleges my dear students and all our participants very good morning to all of you so i am very happy to welcome our convener and all our resource person i am also happy to introduce the resource person of the first session dr dj bakir raj he is a pioneering scientist in the area of mycorrhizal fungi he was born in bangalore on 9th october 1940 he completed his graduation in 1961 post graduation in 1963 and phd in agricultural microbiology in the year 1972 from university of agriculture sciences bangalore with gold medal he was a department of agricultural microbiology in the same university bangalore in various capacities from assistant professor to head of the department of uh, the same university from 1960 to 66 to 2000 he had his post doctoral training at new zealand australia uk he currently worked as a insta honorable scientist and the chairman of a center for natural biological resources and the community development at bangalore we know he is one of the pioneering scientists in the area of mycorrhizal fungi he has published 400 research papers 100 more than 100 review articles and 11 books He has mentored nearly five PhD students and 23 PhD scholars. He has been the principal investigator of 33 completed research projects and two ongoing research projects. He has been invi invited either to deliver lectures or evaluate projects on mycorrhiza in different parts of the world. 
He has been an expert committee member for several funding agencies in our country and overseas. So in India, he is a member of an expert committee in ICAR, CSAR, DST, DBT, ICFRI, AICAR. So he has received several awards and honors, the noteworthy award from the hands of renowned mycologist Dr. Hawksworth in the year 2018 at UK. He is a fellow of most of the national academies, Indian Academy of Sciences, Indian National Science Academy and the National Academy of Sciences. He is a president of the Indian Society of Soil Biology and Ecology from 2000 to till date. He has been a president of MSI during 2011 and 2012. He is editor in chief of uh, Journal of Soil Biology and Ecology and a member of uh, editorial board of uh, various journals. Dr. Bakir Raj was invited by the European Commission to contribute on mycorrhizal fungi for the Global Soil Biodiversity Atlas. He was the only Indian scientist invited for this, which was released in May 2016 at Belgium for his uh, contribution contribution on uh, the mycorrhizal fungi, it has been named as Glomus Vakiraji. An inspiring teacher, an active researcher and the educationalist, Professor Vakiraj is internationally respected for his uh, dedication to the science. Such an eminent uh, scientist uh, with us as a resource person today, as a convener of our uh, virtual workshop. So on my own behalf, and the St. Joseph's College management behalf and the Department of Botany behalf and the participants behalf, I welcome him. I welcome you, sir, over to our resource person. Please, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Francis. And uh, I would like to thank all the resource persons. I should have done it during the inaugural session. I forgot to do that. So I really like to thank the resource persons, Dr. Ara Rao, Dr. Shivanna, and Dr. Sanjapa, who are all my very good friends and who readily accept whenever I request them. And whenever they request, I also accept. So, so I thank all. <laughs> Just have the presentation. No, done. Yeah. Okay. 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 I, I hope you can see the presentation. Can you? Yes, we are seeing your slides, sir. Uh, okay, see so the slide and also the voice is clear. Yeah. Okay. Very clear. Okay. Okay. So the to the topic which I want to talk is on soil biodiversity, uh, which is the one of the themes of the uh, lecture workshop, and its status and recent advance. Okay. When we talk of soil biodiversity. We look of we talk. We are, I'm going to talk of diversity that is existing in soil. For that, we should understand what soil is first. So, what soil means? It means different things to different people. Okay. So, people living in cities, big cities like Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore. So, what does it mean? Soil. So, a young boy or a girl goes with a beautiful, nice shirt, man uh, pants. Or a skirt or a sari, something falls on the pant, what he will or she will do immediately try to get rid of it. So it is an unwanted thing for a city person. What about a gardener or a farmer? So it is it is it gives him the livelihood. He grows the crop and he make he sells them and give, gets a living. So it's the most important thing for a gardener, for an engineer, let us say civil engineer. Somebody asks the civil engineer, please build a house for us. So what he does first, he takes the soil to put the foundation. So he takes the soil, throws it away 
again it is not needed for, for him it is an unwanted material for a civil engineer so for different people soil means different things so for a biologist what does it mean it is a fascinating habitat teeming with life in fact it is said that when you take a teaspoon of soil and then try to see the flora and fauna in it it may run to not only millions sometimes to billions so that is the type of life that is present in soil this is a soil profile we know that soil is formed from rock so what is what we have is the rock from which it undergoes weathering it's a very slow process hundreds of years sometimes thousands of years and then the soil is formed so this profile will show you the bottom most row where is our horizon is the parent rock and it undergoes partial uh, weathering that which is the sea horizon you can see and then the b horizon is the is soil which is below not the surface the top soil is called as the a horizon soil 0 to 20 cm which is very rich in organic matter supporting plant growth the one below that 20 to 100 cm the subsoil what we call is is also rich in nutrients but it supports the plants which are deep rooted okay so the a and b horizons are the ones which are important for improve, for the plant growth okay <clears throat> then it is estimated 99% of the world's food come from crops grown in soil or the livestock or the birds which which are maintain themselves feeding on the plants growing on the soil and people do not appreciate it why people don't appreciate because the life within the soil both flora uh, flora and fauna is hidden we cannot see it so so often what is out of sight is out of mind the common saying so we don't appreciate what is hidden and what is below the soil <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> soil biology or biodiversity is a study of biological systems occurring in soil and soil is alive and supports a variety of flora and fauna and we know united nation declared 2010 as the international year of biodiversity and now from 2011 to 2020 few more months left and one, so we are in the decade of biodiversity and the organisms in the soil range from very small to large invertebrates and small mammals so it is said that one fourth of the biodiversity in the earth comes from soil so you can see here in the nearly one fourth of the biodiversity earth's biodiversity comes from soil and how do we classify these organisms present in soil it is based on the size of the organism when the size is between 1 to 100 micrometer which includes bacteria and fungi we call them as microflora when they are little bigger ranging in size from 5 to 120 micrometers including protozoa archaeozoa we call them as microfauna still bigger 80 micrometers to 2 millimeters which includes columbola nematodes etc we call them as mesofauna and still bigger 500 to 50 mill micrometers to 50 millimeters which includes earworms termites etc we call them as macrofauna then <clears throat> if the organism in the soil if it's a bigger size more attention has been given and it has been studied more if the organism is small it has been studied less and so less information is available compared to organisms that are bigger in in size just to give an example here taking the vascular plants the estimated uh, total species of vascular plants is 300000 and the number of plants known to are 70000 that means we know 90% of the vascular plants in, in existing in nature but when we come to macrofauna 
let us take example of ants we know only 58% of the ants existing in nature 53% of termites coming to mesofauna mites only 3% 27% of columbola nematodes only 1.8% when we come to still smaller ones, microfauna, protozoa, we know 7.5%. When it comes to microflora, unlike fungi and bacteria, we know only 3% of the microorganisms existing in nature. So smaller the size, we know less, we have studied less of them. So I will very briefly cover the various groups of soil biota existing in soil, which includes macrofauna, mesofauna, microfauna, algae, fungi, bacteria, and also organisms which are smaller than bacteria, which are mycoplasmas, viruses, viroids, and prions, very briefly. <clears throat> okay, coming to macrofauna, which includes earthworms, mollusks, insects, millipedes, earwigs, etc. What is the major role played by the macrofauna? The, the major role is they break down the organic matter. That is decomposition of organic matter. Then they improve by that, they improve soil structure, aeration and water infiltration to the deeper layers. And very importantly, they predate on soil microorganisms and thereby they maintain the biological equilibrium in soil, which is very, very important. And I just included some of the macrofauna, crypts, termites, ants, earthworms, millipedes, centipedes, and varieties of beetles. And we can see the varieties, including the dung beetle, which rolls the cow the human feces, and then takes it to its nest. And it also includes the ones which are bigger, like spiders, slugs, snails, etc. So these are all the macrofauna, examples of macrofauna. And here is a very interesting photograph I could get. This is a giant earthworm, which is found in the Amazon forest in Brazil. And you can see the person who is holding the earthworm, see the length of the earthworm, it's as tall as the per person himself. So the name of the earthworm is Rhinodrillus prioli. And in, the, in our country, in Western Ghats, we have another earthworm called Ravida, which is very big. Many times people can mistake that it is a small snake. It is as big as that. So these are the various examples of macrofauna. Then coming to mesofauna, which are a little smaller than macrofauna, includes mites, springtails, rotifers, nematodes, tardigrades, etc. And of all these groups, the one which has been studied to the maximum extent are the nematodes. So varieties of nematodes, some of them are pathogenic, some of them are herbivorous, some of them are carnivorous. But the ones with the group that has been studied under mesofauna to the maximum extent, nematodes. And some of the nematodes are important than pathogens. They cause diseases. And we are all familiar with the root knot nematode, which is very destructive on solanaceous crop plants. And some of them are, they, again, they are important because they eat the bacterial flora and regulate the microbial population in the soil. And I have included some of the uh, for, uh, photographs of uh, mesofauna, which includes tardigrades, nematodes, rotifers, mites, and springtails, which are all springtails. Some, uh, sometimes we can even see on books when we don't use a book for a long time and then open it. You can see the small uh, uh, springtail running there. So most of, most of it, it lives in soil, but it can live outside the soil also. Coming to the next category is the microfauna, which includes protozoa and archaeozoa. And archaeozoa differs from protozoa in that they do not have mitochondria. That's the only difference between protozoa and archaeozoa. And all both, both our groups are single cell invertebrates living in soil. And they are important predators of bacteria, 
algae and other organisms in soil thereby they regulate the population in soil some of them are pathogens human pathogens we all of us are familiar with entamoeba uh, histolytica which causes amoebic dysentery in man and again another organism which is becoming popular in bangalore is the flagellate gayardia which is uh, causing gayardiasis and this is spreading fairly fast in bangalore which results in foul smelling watery diarrhea and i have just included some of the uh, photographs of amoeba flagellate and ciliate which represent the microfauna coming to the next category algae algae are all photosynthetic and they like aquatic or marshy environment and they play a very important role in soil and wherever the soil has um, it's exposed to light and also it is present and it also forms a symbiotic association with fungi which this association we call as lichens which we we, we can see on the tree trunks and also on rocks you can see the example here is given which are lichens which is on the on a rock and so what the form of this algae and lichens they play a very important role especially lichens play a very important role in weathering of rock and then making of soil that is a very important role they and some of them are important they fix atmospheric nitrogen and uh, they play a role in soil aggregation and they add lot of organic matter to the soil which is helpful for plant growth and coming to the next group fungi fungi are sometimes they are microscopic I mean, in unicellular some of them are macroscopic big in size like mushroom fungi and puffballs and we can see the important role they play is the decomposition of organic matter when a dead animal or a leaf material or a plant material is buried in soil they play a very important role in decomposing the organic matter they also play a role in soil aggregation and um, nutrient cycling biocontrol of plant pathogens there are many or fungi which help in the control of plant pathogens and some of them are edible and and we know that many fungi cause diseases in plants animals and even human beings and i just included some of the the photographs here the unicellular yeast we know that yeast play a very important role in bakeries in distilleries and uh, all these uh, places and uh, in the in the fermentation of grape juice to wine and so on and penicillium which is important in producing various antibiotics and the fungus mycorrhizal fungus and which plays an important role again in the nutrition of plants and again ectomycorrhizal fungi playing an important role in case of forestry species mushrooms which are edible and some of the fungi which can trap nematodes and kill them and thereby beneficial to mankind coming to the next category of organisms in soil or which are smaller compared to fungi or bacteria bacteria includes actinomycetes and nowadays actinomycetes are called as actinobacteria so the term bacteria now taxonomically includes actinobacteria also and it also includes archaea are what are these archaea archaea are the bacteria which are found in extreme environments very cold environment or very hot environment like hot springs like for example and in soil they are very common bacteria occurs in very large numbers in soil and again there can be two categories of bacteria in soil autochthonous autochthonous bacteria that means the bacteria which always exist in a particular soil okay it is an indigenous bacteria so you just go out and in a college campus take the soil analyze for the bacteria you what you are seeing now maybe after 6 months you go there take the soil sample analyze you see the same bacteria these are the indigenous bacteria which is always present they are the autochthonous bacteria 
coming to the second category which is zymogenous bacteria they come and then grow rapidly and disappear after some time say for example by mistake you add some urea to the soil what happens the urea decomposing organisms suddenly multiply they appear and till the urea is there they are present when once the urea is lost it's completely decomposed they also disappear so such organisms are called as zymogenous bacteria so what is the role played by these or bacteria in soil they play a very important role in nutrient cycling we know nitrogen cycle phosphorus cycle sulfur cycle so they play a very very important role in nutrient cycling organic matter decomposition production of industrially important secondary metabolites like antibiotics like the enzymes vitamins and so on and some of them cause diseases in plants and animals and also human beings and coming to the bacterial diseases and we can say that we have varieties of bacterial diseases the very common example which i want to tell is the the brown rot of potato so when you go to the market and buy potato and try to cut it you see a brown ring so that is why it's called as brown rot of potato and it is caused by the bacterium lorstonia solanaceae and even when you go to the shop and then buy chips and still i can see that many of the many times the, the chips also has the brown ring so you can still see that uh, the, rot, uh, the rotting caused by the bacteria and now another bacterium has become very bacteria has become very important that is the bacterial blight of pomegranate many countries are refusing to take pomegranate from india because of this bacteria because this is caused by xanthomonas axinopodis punicae and so whatever goes comes back to india because they refuse to take it because it is infected with the bacterial blight similarly animal diseases all of us are familiar with anthrax or cow or in cattle leptospirosis and so on and in humans we are all very very familiar with typhoid caused by salmonella cholera cholera caused by vibrio the dysentery caused by caused by shigella and so on i just included one petri dish containing different colonies of bacteria you can see how they differ in their colony morphology different in also differing in color some are yellow some are red some are white and the morphology also differs and there are three main categories uh, as far as the shape of bacteria are concerned they are round shape which are called as cocci or they are rod shaped and they are called as bacillus or they are spiral in shape then they are called as spiral <clears throat> so these are the three shapes of bacteria and coming to the organisms which are smaller than bacteria we have mycoplasmas mycoplasmas are bacteria only but they do not have cell wall so these are the mycoplasmas and the ones which are smaller than that are the viruses viruses are nothing but a, <clears throat> either rna or dna with a protein coat okay they are the viruses and we are all sure and we know many of the viruses and what are viroids viroids they have the protein coat uh, <clears throat> but they do not have Uh, sorry they have the nucleic acid and they do not have the protein coat and the next category is prions they do not have the nucleic acid and they have only the protein coat but all of them live in soil and they can act as pathogens so these are the various categories of flora and fauna which occur in soil and uh, <clears throat> and can cause many things useful things to man or benefit or uh, things which are bad to mankind so here let us see the population pyramid of soil organisms reveals that if larger the size if the size of the organism is bigger they have been studied more and if they are less they have been studied to a lesser extent and another interesting example has been done regarding correlation there some correlation studies have been done and what has come out of this study is there is no correlation between the size and the biomass 
and no correlation between population density and the importance to the biological activity. Let us take the second one first. There is no correlation between population density and importance to biological activity in the soil. In a particular soil, let us say there are only two earthworms and there are billion protozoa. But what when we think of the biological activity importance, then the two earthworms may be more effective than a billion protozoa. So that's why we say there is no correlation between population density and importance to the biological activity. Other category is there is no correlation between the size of the organism and to the extent they contribute to the biomass in soil. <clears throat> so here this is a very interesting slide. You can see my bacteria and fungi, microbes, which are very small in size, but to what extent they contribute to the soil biomass? 80%. That's a very simple method, a carbon uh, uh, method uh, to a, by which we can chloroform method by which we can uh, estimate the biomass in soil. And these my tiny microbes contribute to 80% of the soil biomass. Whereas the macrofauna, which is big in size, contributes only 14%. And mesofauna and microfauna contribute only to 2%. So there is no correlation between the size and to the extent they contribute to the biomass in soil. And what are the various ecosystem services provided by the soil biota? And they are, <coughs> I've just listed here, the decomposition of organic matter. Then regulation of nutrient availability to the plants, suppression of pests and diseases in plants, and maintenance of soil structure and regulation of the hydrological processes. And another important thing which is given a lot of importance is the carbon sequestration and soil detoxification. When an adverse pesticide, fungicide, herbicide is added to soil, these microflora play a very important role in detoxifying it. They play a very, very important role in plant growth control. And some of them help even in the pollination of horticultural crops. Some of the soil nesting insects have been shown to play a very important role in the pollination. The same thing is given in the form of a diagram here, picture. You can see what are all the e ecosystem services provided by soil biota, they play, they regulate the biological population, uh, regulating the biological population in soil, carbon cycling, decomposition of organic matter, help with the soil structure and maintenance. They play a role in plant growth production and biotechnology, when you say biotechnology, the biotechnologists look to the soil for the various microorganisms where they can get which can produce enzymes, vitamins, antibiotics, and so on. Nutrient cycling, where they produce, uh, they provide the plants with the various nutrients, habitat support, climate regulation, and so on. These are the various ecosystem services provided by the soil biota. Coming to the Millennium Ecosystem uh, Assessment, <clears throat> this global uh, organization defines ecosystem services or the benefits people obtain from the ecosystem. The benefits you and me get from the ecosystem. And they have categorized that into four groups. So what are these four groups? They are the supporting services. That means like nutrient cycling, soil formation, etc. Number two is provisioning services like food, fuel, fresh water. They provide food, their fuel, and so on. Regulatory services like waste purification, climate regulation, and the fourth category is cultural services like recreational aesthetics. Okay, these so are the four group, different groups of services provided by the ecosystem to mankind. Coming to the soil organisms, the soil microfauna and flora provide contribute to all the four services, and that is why they play a very important role 
in the ecosystem regulation and services provided to mankind we'll just take few examples of these ecosystem services and then go into the details as to how they help mankind all okay so okay coming to organic matter decomposition <coughs> and organic matter decomposition when a dead animal or a plant material is buried in the soil what happens we know that the what the nobel laureate waxman said if there would have been no decomposing microorganisms on earth all the dead animals plants etc including man would remain on the soil surface there won't be any place place for man to live that's what he has said so a decomposition of an organic matter is a very important service that is provided by soil flora and fauna so when a dead animal or a plant material is buried in soil what all it contains it contains sugar starch cellulose pectins proteins tannins etc etc and usually microbiologists always think that only microorganisms are play the role in the decomposition of organic matter it is not true it is the macrofauna or the mesofauna play a very important role and what is that <clears throat> usually the mollusks millipedes insect they attack the litter let us take an example of a leaf material so what they do they puncture the leaf epidermis and this process of puncturing the leaf epidermis is called as fenestration i'll show the picture how it looks a little later and then they by this process they increase the surface area for the decomposition by microorganisms so if the macrofauna are excluded then organic matter de decomposition becomes very slow and a very interesting very simple experiment has been done by a scientist what he did was he took bags with different pore sizes and added lot of leaf material in it and buried it in soil and took it out after 3 months and saw to what extent it has been decomposed when the size the pore size of the bag or the mesh was 7 mm okay 7 mm was the size of the hole in the bag then there was 95% decomposition that means it allowed the mesofauna and macrofauna to enter and there were decomposition to play and here when he made the bag with the pore size of 0.5 mm then the decomposition was only 35% because it did not allow the invertebrates for invertebrates to go so but it allowed only the microbes and smaller fauna to act on it so this is a very clear cut example of how it's a combined effect of fauna plus flora which brings about decomposition this is the leaf which showing the fenestration and this i have already done this i have completed and so let us see <clears throat> the organic matter is added onto the soil so what happens these mollusks wild lice millipedes they macerate the litter and pulverize it yet worms insects burrowing creatures they transport it down down into the soil and again yet worms and pot worms they mix it with the soil makes it a part of the soil and that is how what we get at the end is the com compost and this compost gets mixed with the soil and and some of it will not undergo full decomposition so this is what we call as water insoluble but alkali soluble substance and it is called as humus so humus is also decomposable but at a very 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 slow rate and so humus when it is added on to the soil to a small extent it can be acted upon by organisms and in a very slow way and yet it releases the nutrients for plant growth and and a very simple experiment has been done by the scientists and here again because of a collaboration between microbiologist and zoologist so they did a very simple experiment what they did was they took three different species of earthworms lumbricus rubellus lumbricus terrestris 
and aporectoria trapezoids. These are the three earthworms. And what they did, they took a soil sample and then on the top of the soil sample, they smeared with a plant growth promoting rhizobacterium, which promotes plant growth, that is Pseudomonas chlorosus. So they made, make a, they made a smear of this bacterium on the surface of the soil and they had four treatments. One is where they did not leave any, any earthworm. And again, three earthworms are the three different treatments. And they looked for to what depth the bacterium, the beneficial bacterium has been taken down in the soil. The first, the first one took it down up to 20 centimeters. And the second one took it down up to 40 centimeters. The third earthworm also took it down to 40 centimeters. Perhaps if they would have gone a little deeper, it would have taken it a little further. So, but of these two organisms which have taken up to 40 centimeters, the population of the beneficial bacterium was higher in the third earthworm. So, what they concluded from this is that the earthworms play a very, very important role in taking down the beneficial organisms to the subsoil, thereby helping the plants with deeper root system to take the nutrients from the subsoil. So very simple experiment giving many results. And coming to another um, <coughs> ecosystem services produced by the soil flora and fauna is the symbiotic nitrogen fixation. And we know that legumes are all nodulated. The roots of legumes have nodules in them. And inside the nodule, we have the, some bacteria. And we know that plenty of nitrogen is present in the atmosphere. Nearly 80% by volume is nitrogen in the atmosphere. But plants cannot directly use this nitrogen. But there are bacteria which can fix this nitrogen and make it available for plant growth. And a classical example are the legumes which form these nodules. And the rhizobium is the bacterium which sits inside the nodule and fixes the atmospheric nitrogen and makes it available for plant growth. So in rhizobia, we have the root nodules. There are other plants also which form nodules. There is another uh, example is a green manure plant, Susbania rostrata. This particular plant is grown by the farmers before taking a paddy crop. So they grow this uh, green manure crop, they puddle it inside the soil, then they transplant rice. So this particular uh, green manure plant not only forms nodules in the root, it also forms nodules in the stem. That is why it is called as a sem nodulating bacterium. The bacterium is Azorhizobium colinodens. Okay. And another organism, the example I can give is Casuarina. We know that Casuarina grows in very sandy soils. And why? Because it produces nodules, and the nodules here are not caused by rhizobium, but it is formed by an actinobacterium, this is Branchia, and they, they produce very large nodules. And, and fix atmospheric nitrogen. And many studies have shown nearly 50% of the nitrogen fertilizer can be saved through inoculation with these nitrogen fixing organisms. I have just included a slide here showing the root nodule of a legume. You can see the nodules appear pink in color. More the pink in color, the presumption is that it is a better nitrogen fixer. That is because of a particular pigment that is present in the nodule. It is called leg hemoglobin. More the leg hemoglobin, it is a better nitrogen fixer. And this is a stem nodulating bacterium. You can see this uh, in case of Suspania rostrata, it produces such stem nodulating bacteria, stem nodules in addition to the root nodule and fixes a lot of nitrogen. And this is the other category, Casuarina. You can see the nodules quite big as big as that of a table tennis ball and they fix atmospheric nitrogen. <clears throat> and I just included one slide here just to show a cowpea crop with without inoculation. So this is uninoculated rows and these are the inoculated rows. You can see the significant difference in plant growth. And again, this table gives you 
information obtained by different scientists from different parts of our country in various leguminous crops inoculated with rhizobium in case of chickpea that is bengal gram 5 to 20 percent increase why this range because this is from different locations different places and similarly in cowpea similarly in pigeon pea red gram mung bean green gram urid bean which is black gram Coming to another category of nitrogen fixation, in the first category, that is symbiotic nitrogen fixation, we, we, we see the nodule formation. But here, the bacteria is present in the soil, it can colonize the rhizosphere, and it penetrates the epidermis, and it sits there and doesn't form any nodule and fixes atmospheric nitrogen. And a classical example of such associative non symbiotic nitrogen fixing organism is azospirillum. Azospirillum, a lot of work has been done in our country on azospirillum, helping fixing nitrogen and helping plant growth. I'll show a little later the slide. And uh, other associative nitrogen fixing bacterium playing a very important role, especially in crops rich in sugar, is Gluconacetobacter diazotropicus. It's a sugar loving bacteria. And as the name itself suggests, it is found in plants like sugar cane, sweet potato, uh, sweet sorghum, and so on. It colonizes the rhizosphere, fixes atmospheric nitrogen, and promotes, promotes plant growth. In fact, sugar cane growers usually inoculate the sugar cane cells with this particular bacterium. That these two are the examples of associative nitrogen fixing organisms. Coming to the next category the free living nitrogen fixing bacteria. And the a classical example is Astrobacter. It never enters the plant root. It just colonizes the rhizosphere. Rhizosphere is the region of the soil closely adhering to the plant root. So it colonizes the rhizosphere and fixes atmospheric nitrogen. And uh, Astrobacter, a lot of work has been done in our country on Astrobacter. And another free living nitrogen fixing organism or the blue green algae or nowadays they're called as cyanobacteria i just included example of that has been done by scientists from our country and we in case of amaranthus because of azospiral inoculation 36 percent increase has been reported in case of coffee seedling 50 percent increase has been reported coming to the free living nitrogen fixing organism astrobacter See in various crop plants like cabbage, 19%, tomato, 28%. In case of brinjal, up to 42% increase in growth and yield has been reported. Coming to cyanobacteria, the blue green algae, they are just a lot of work has been done in Tamil Nadu and also Madhya Pradesh and in uh, uh, and also in Chhattisgarh. And I can say that. Here, there is, uh, I have taken one example, 17% increase in rice sale has been reported in case because of inoculation with the BGA. And in this just a, a blue-green alga showing the atrocysts, which are bigger in size compared to vegetative cells. And that is a site of nitrogen fixation where the alga fixes atmospheric nitrogen. And here, this is a very interesting slide I took from Kanyakumari district. And here is a farmer who is multiplying his own BGA or cyanobacteria. It's very easy to multiply. You have to just get the, some, uh, the original culture from some uh, resource. And then what we do is, what he has made is just made a trench and then covered it with a polythene sheet, added some water and sprinkled some soil, inoculated with the BGA. And in three weeks, it covers the entire a trench and which he can collect and use it for inoculating the rice field. So this is a very simple technology which the farmers themselves can mass produce the inoculum. Then to sum up, I just included the nitrogen sun. The nitrogen is present plenty in the atmosphere. Here we have the nitrogen fixing bacteria uh, and the example of legumes and it fixes the atmospheric nitrogen. What it fixes is the ammonical form. And we know that most of the plants do not take ammonical form of nitrogen. So it, uh, they take nitrate form of nitrogen. There are certain other bacteria which are called as nitrifying bacteria. So nitrosomonas which con converts ammonium to nitrite. 
and then nitrate is converted to nitrate and and then it this nitrate is taken by the plants and here this nitrate which is which is available for plant growth can also escape to the atmosphere through the activity of a group of bacteria called as denitrifying bacteria example is pseudomonas denitrificans so they act on nitrate and the nitrogen escapes back to the to the atmosphere so this is in brief about the nitrogen cycle coming to another major plant nutrient it is a phosphorus you know tropical soils are deficient in phosphorus and in our country the majority of the soils that of the tropical type and they are deficient in phosphorus not, not only they are deficient any soil having less than 10 ppm available p is said to be deficient in phosphorus and we have soils in south india ranging from 5 to 6 ppm in fact some parts of karnataka we have only 3 ppm available p so you can see that the soil is very deficient in phosphorus in addition to that when a farmer adds a phosphatic fertilizer like single super phosphate what happens 75 to 80 percent of the fertilizer what is added is converted to a form which is not available for plant growth in case of acidic soils it is converted to iron and aluminium phosphate and in alkaline and saline soils it is converted to calcium phosphate which the plant roots cannot take so this is the situation our soils are deficient in phosphorus and when the, phosph when the phosphatic fertilizer is added and it is converted to a form which the plant roots cannot take and here again the phosphate solubilizing microorganisms both bacteria and fungi play a very very important role i've just given the examples of bacteria and fungi like bacillus polymyxa pseudomonas aspergillus penicillium and they act and they act on unavailable form of phosphorus and release the available form which the plant roots can take so plant roots usually take the phosphorus in the form of h2po4 form so they act on unavailable form and release this po4 which the plant roots can take and in our soil in our country a lot of rock phosphate is available which is a very cheap source of phosphorus and farmers now buy this rock phosphate inoculate with the phosphate solubilizing organism and they get a good crop growth as if they have added phosphatic fertilizer and i have just given some examples how we check the phosphate solubilizing ability of a bacterium in the laboratory so this is a tricalcium phosphate medium and we inoculate with the bacterium and look for the zone of solubilization bigger the zone of solubilization we presume that it is a better p solubilizer which we use multiply and use it as a p solubilizer i have included one bacterium and one fungus which are effective p solubilizers and just to include some data and which i have worked that and in our country by inoculating with the phosphate solubilizing organism in where the increase in crop growth in K, cabbage tobacco cucumber we have the various uh, increases up to 56 percent in cabbage 37 percent in tomato have been reported coming to arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi they help in p uptake i won't go into this because the other talk is on phosphate aspergillus i mean uh, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi so i will skip that and uh, come to the next category of organism the plant growth promoting rhizoorganisms and here what we mean by plant growth promoting rhizoorganisms or rhizomicroorganisms is that those organisms which promote plant growth through directly or indirectly how do they directly promote plant growth to the production of phytohormones and so indirectly by suppressing plant disease and so these are the various uh, fight, I mean, pgprs which have been studied extensively throughout the world the one which has been studied extensively is pseudomonas fluorescence globally including india the next one is burkholderia cytasia so the ones which have been less studied are the ones which i have listed here methylobacterium Azoarchus, Pantia, Penibicillus, and to some extent, some studies have been introduced in Tamil Nadu on methylobacteria. 
considerable work has been done in the Tamil Nadu Agricultural University Madurai campus on Methylobacterium as a PGPR. But very little work has been done on other organisms. Fortunately, we had one project, uh, so it's a women scientist project funded by DST, and that lady worked on these two organisms, Pantia and Penibacillus, and she got very interesting results. And she worked on French beans and various, uh, she took it from the lab to the glass house, to the field, and finally ended up with a farmer's field. And we could see that this particular organism Pantia agglomerans was the best for inoculating French bean even under farmer's field conditions, which has increased the fruit yield which, and also the floatal plant dry biomass. And microbes are also used for the biocontrol of plant diseases. And we know that Trichoderma is Harzianum and Viridae is a fungus which is available in the market. One can go and buy this and use it for controlling various plant diseases. Just I'll give one example in case of pigeon pea, that is the red gram, the wilt disease is very serious, caused by Fusarium udum, and which can effectively control by Fusarium. So if you see the list, again, Trichoderma dominates. So just saying, it is the best fire control agent. Again, coming to a bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis, again, is very effective. <clears throat> and you can, you can see the a petri dish containing the bacterium and here the larva which is killed by the bacillus thuringiensis and again uh, thing which is available in the market a farmer can go and buy and coming to the next category pesticide degradation and our farmers now use lot of pesticides fungicides insecticides herbicides and they are they some of them remain in soil for a very long time but we do have certain bacteria and fungi which use them as the carbon source and the energy source and then make them disappear from the soil thereby detoxification of these adverse uh, uh, detoxifying chemicals so they result these my soil flora help in the disappearance of these pesticides in soil coming to extension to the other fields again as i told the industrialists are looking into the soil for various groups of organisms. And we know the various antibiotics are produced by soil, fungi and bacteria, vitamins and uh, gibralic acid, enzymes, all of them come from. So the industrialists now look for soil as the source from where they can get the biodiversity. And coming to the eco ecosystem services provided by the biodiversity, people don't think to what extent the uh, the microbes in the soil or the ecos uh, the uh, flora and fauna in the soil contribute in terms of cash money so such attempts have been done in us and they have given a value for each one of the ecosystem service provided by the soil of flora and fauna so for example for decomposition of organic matter they have given 760 billion dollars per year Nitrogen fixation, $90 billion per year. For biocontrol of pests, $160 billion. So I think in our country, we should go and then with the help of the economists, we should work out this. And coming to threats to biodiversity, biodiversity we always talk about threats to soil, soil biodiversity. And it is mainly because of pollution. And who is responsible for pollution? It is the bank. So we are responsible for, for the threats to the soil biodiversity. We stand in the top of the list. And so what are the other threats? Above ground, loss of above ground biodiversity, of introduction of alien species, overgrazing, climate change, agricultural practices. Earlier we were using mixed cropping, now all monocropping, maize grown in several hectares, and land degradation, desertification, soil erosion. These are all the threats to soil biodiversity. And the same thing, again, maximum extent, who is responsible? It is the human intensive exploitation. So how can we conserve soil biodiversity? And again, measures are diversification of cross plan, crop plan. Use different crops. Don't use only one crop. Less tillage. No tillage is difficult. Less tillage. And again, fire management, which is becoming very serious nowadays. 
soil erosion control, agroforestry, don't grow only have some forestry species also. Soil amendments, biological soil amendments, bio remediation, and so on. So these are the things which have been suggested to conserve soil biodiversity. And all of us love to play with soil. As children, we have all played with soil. Okay. Now, but how much we the children know about soil biodiversity is a question. This is in case of a primary school children were asked by the teacher to know to draw what they know about soil biodiversity. This is what a primary school child has written, has drawn. You can see this. So from this, what we can conclude, the primary school child knows that there is something living in soil. The child knows that. Coming to the older children, little older children, again, the school children, the four to seven year old children, when they were asked what they know about biodiversity, soil biodiversity, or what they know about soil, what they said, without soil, there is only a big hole. Another child said, trees grow on soil. And another child said, my ball won't bounce back. And another child said, without soil, we will tumble down, we will go down. This is what the smaller children said up to seven years. Coming to little older children, seven to nine years, one child said, plants grow in soil. Another child said, in soil there is seed. I don't know where it's uh, so much seed. Uh, and uh, another child said, foxes live in caves and soil. Perhaps they saw some bandicoot or rats and thought it is a fox. So they said foxes live in caves and soil. Then coming to bigger children, 9 to 11 year old children, they said trees grow in soil. True, even the small child said that. But they add, the child added one more sentence. They produce oxygen for humans and animals. That means the child knows the importance of plants growing in soil. Another child said, I can find earthworms in soil with which I can catch fish. So again, the child knows the importance of biodiversity in soil. United Nations declared 2010 as the International Year of Biodiversity. For the first time, the biodiversity of soil was brought to life spotlight. And European Atlas of Soil Biodiversity was brought out by the European Commission in 2010. Yes, it was a European Atlas. Okay. And the FAO arranged a workshop, international technical workshop on managing living soil at Rome in 2012 in the FAO headquarters in December uh, 5 to 7. And what came out of this program is the Soil Partnership Program, Global Soil Partnership Program. What is this program supposed to do? And how to manage soils for what? Food security, agriculture, yeah. mitigation of climate change, poverty alleviation, and sustainable development. These were the things for which we have to manage soils. And they, they recognized five pillars for action. One is soil management, investments, research, information, and data, and standards. So these were the five pillars. And each pillar, uh, there was a group, a team of scientists who were asked to work on these. So soil management deals with living soils, pillar one. And, and pillar three is what research can be done on soil. So I had the privilege of being the committee member for both Pillar 1 and Pillar 3. And in the United Nations again declared 2015 as the International Year of Soils. And so all of us are very familiar with the Father's Day, Mother's Day, Valentine's Day. I'm sure that many people are not very familiar with the World Soil Day. So at least now one should remember 5th December of every year is the World Soil Day. And again in 2013, FAO decided to bring out the Global Atlas on Soil Biodiversity. So earlier it was European Atlas, now it is a Global Atlas. So what they did was they selected 100 scientists from 26 countries and three to four scientists working on each group. For example, earthworm, three to four scientists working on earthworms were made as a team. 
they were asked to write on their poems, bring beautiful photographs for this global atlas. Similarly, three to four scientists working on nitrogen fixation like that. So finally, what they said, the information should be in a very simple language. It is not for scientists. It is for common man. So a common man, when he sees, reads the atlas, he must be able to understand it. But it should have beautiful photographs. So that was the criterion. And again, as I as it was said, I had the privilege of being the only Indian scientist invited by FAO to contribute on mycorrhizal fungi for the global atlas, which was released in Belgium in 2016. I have included the first page of the atlas and the last page of the atlas. This is, if you go to the FAO website and then just type global soil biodiversity atlas, you can freely download the atlas. Or if your library wants to have a copy of it, it costs 26 euros. It's, a, um, it's given at a very cheap rate and then it is 26 euros, you know, so you can order for it. Before concluding, I will say, usually what is the trend? When our children start playing in soil, what we say, don't play with soil, don't make yourself dirty. But this is a very interesting uh, research that was done in Brazil. And they found that the village children were playing with soil and that particular soil had a bacterium, Mycobacterium vacae, which is a saprophytic organism which produces a hormone called as serotonin. And these children inhaled this bacterium when they were playing with soil and which made them feel very happy. So the children were very happy, relaxed, because it's called happy hormone. Okay, it improves the various mental activities and they were, they were very good in learning their lessons and so on. So this report came, don't prevent children from playing in soil. And following this, the National Institute of Health and Welfare in Finland studied the studied asthma occurrence in rural and urban children below six years age. Urban and rural children, to what extent they are have the incidence of asthma. What they found was the rural children, it was only 4% of the children had asthma. Urban children, it was 29%. From this, they concluded that it is the organism beneficial microbes in soil which was protecting them increasing their immunity against asthma whereas the children in the urban areas they were exposed to traffic pollution and that's why the incidence is more this study done in finland was confirmed later by studies in other parts of europe and usa and the conclusion now is early life exposure to soil matters a lot in increasing your immunity to various uh, diseases or whatever it is. So now, now at least I think we should not prevent children from playing with soil. And what we can conclude, soil is the reservoir of several organisms. Soil biologists study them in isolation. Okay, The soil zoologist will never mix with the soil microbiologist and never mix with an ecologist. So it's all airtight air compartment. So it, soil biodiversity is very critical for plant growth, climate regulation, ecosystem functioning, disease control, and uh, human health. And there is need for collaboration among soil biologists working on different groups of soil organisms. Here I would like to give one example. From my lab in a microbiology lab, we collaborated with the zoology group and the entomology group. And we came up with the conclusion that wasps, ants, and uh, termites, and these things, uh, and earthworms act as excellent disseminators of mycorrhizal fungi. And we came to the conclusion the wasps can carry the mycorrhizal fungi to a distance of 200 kilometers and transmit it. So such good results can come when we collaborate with each other. So coordinated studies are needed between soil biologists, soil chemists, agronomists, biochemists, ecologists, you can include any other branch of scientists. So more research is needed to understand the complicated and interlocked processes carried out by organisms in soil in order to derive 
from them the benefits for mankind. So healthy soils, we have healthy plants. When we have healthy plants, they have healthy animals which feed on it. Naturally, healthy children and healthy as others. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, probably you can write it down and I can see and answer. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your excellent presentation on soil microflora. Dear participants, if you have any questions or a clarification in the topic, uh, so please post your questions in the chat box. So the moderator will represent the question to the resource person. If you have any questions, post your question in chat box. Questions there are voices. I everything is very clear. Yes, sir. <laughs> no, if uh, no questions means I usually conclude that everything is very clear or nothing <laughs> is clear. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. T. So, dear parents, we will break the session uh, for T for 10 minutes. Are you so after 10? Yeah, 10 minutes. Sir. Yeah, yeah. 15 minutes. Can we give a little more minutes. time? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 15 minutes will give. So by yeah. 11 uh, 30, we can start. Yeah. 11 30. Fine. 11 30 is fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the same link, uh, you can use the same link for the second session also. Thank you. Please join with us by 11 30 sharply. Thank you, sir.
Dear participants, yes, yes, I am ready. We are going to start the second session. So please join with us through the YouTube link. Friends, since we are going to start uh, the session, please be joined with us to link. Okay. Uh, shall we start or? Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can proceed, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, the second uh, topic uh, which I would like to talk is on arbor mycorrhizal fungi diversity and uh, their role in sustainable agriculture. And uh, when we talk of uh, mycorrhiza, I think the word must be familiar to most of you. The myco standing for fungi, Riza standing for roots. It has an interesting history. It was a German botanist, A.B. Frank, coined this term mycorrhiza. And he was a person um, interested in fungi occurring in forests. So he used to go to the forest, collect various fungi, bring it to the lab, and study them. So once when he made a trip, he found that uh, the roots of pine seedlings were covered with certain fungal growth. Okay. So he thought it must be a fish. So he brought the, the samples, he isolated the fungus, ectomycorrhizal fungi are isolated, can be isolated. So he isolated in the medium and then he inoculated fresh young seedlings with the pathogen, which he thought is a pathogen. And to prove the cost postulates, you know what's cost postulates? When we have a pathogen, we isolate the pathogen from the host, then we re-inoculate a healthy host and see whether it gets the disease. So this is what he was trying to do. And when he inoculated young pine seedlings with which he thought is a pathogen, he thought he found that the plant started growing better. And uh, so he was surprised to see how the plants are growing better. Then he changed his mind and thought it must be a symbiotic fungus, not a pathogen. And that is how he proved and coined the term mycorrhiza, myco standing for fungus, rhiza standing for root. And he went one step further and said, this is a symbiotic association between the plants and roots. And the fungus gets certain compounds from the plant, mainly photosynthesis, and the plant gets certain nutrients through the fungus. So that is how the word mycorrhiza was coined in 1884. So you can think of the word such a long period, 1884 till 1950s. See the gap, 1950s. No work was done on mycorrhiza. And in 1950, a young lady uh, who wanted to do her PhD in the University of London, she was asked to select her PhD thesis work. And her name was Barbara Mosse. And she saw this word mycorrhiza coined by the German scientist, and nothing has been done later. So she decided to work on this for her PhD. And her PhD thesis is on mycorrhizal association in apple. Apple is a very important fruit crop in England. So that is how she decided to work on it. And after completing her PhD, she joined the Rothamsted Experimental Station, which is considered as a mecca for the agricultural scientists. It's a very famous institute all over the world. People used to go there. And... Uh, when she joined as a scientist, she continued her work on mycorrhiza. In addition to continuing her work on mycorrhiza, 
she wanted that people all over the world should know about this symbiosis so she developed a system in which fellowship was given to people who are interested in mycorrhiza and go and work in her lab so she invited applications for people anywhere in the world to go to her lab and work on mycorrhiza with the fellowship so that is how she developed mycorrhizal research and when these scientists when they went back to their country and they started working on mycorrhiza so that is how mycorrhiza started spread it to all over the world and that is why we call dr barbara mosse as the mother of mycorrhiza research and we know that many of these science have fathers but mycorrhiza research has a mother and we are i am very happy to say here that when we organized the international conference on mycorrhiza in bangalore i uh, invited her as the keynote speaker and she came all the way and she stayed with us and gave the keynote address and attended the conference and uh, of course she is no more now and uh, and uh, now we are in 2020 and now we recognize four different categories of mycorrhiza so one is ectomycorrhiza ectomycorrhiza as the name indicates it usually covers the external surface of the root okay and a part of the hypha goes inside and most of it forms a sheath around the root so that is ecto and it is commonly found in temperate forest tree species okay temperate forest tree species like pine for example and the fungi associated are mainly basidiomycetes fungi the second category is a vesicular arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi nowadays called as arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi the word vesicular has been deleted because some of the fungi do not produce vesicles that's why they, there was a particular word has been deleted and all of them produce arbuscles so we call them as arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi i will go into the details a little later because i am going to talk on that particular group of fungi the third category is ericoid mycorrhizal fungi as the name itself suggests it is this particular fungus is restricted to plants belonging to the family ericaceae and which includes plants like blueberries raspberries and uh, azaleas rhododendrons and uh, which again most of it is of temperate origin or temperate uh, region plants in our country we have azaleas and rhododendrons in the himalayan region but we don't grow blueberries in our country and um, so this ericaceous fungi is very specific to plants belonging to ericaceae and uh, we call them as ericoid mycorrhizal fungi which is culturable we can grow that in the laboratory on a culture medium and inoculate blueberry plants and the third cut the, the fourth category is the orchid mycorrhizal fungi and again as a name itself suggests it is very very specific to orchids and when we say the orchids orchids are obligately dependent on these fungi because uh, orchids uh, when they are young we call them as protocorms the seeds are called as protocorms and these protocorms when they are germinating has to be infected by the orchid mycorrhizal fungus if they are not infected by orchid mycorrhizal fungus they do not develop into a plant so to that extent they are obligately dependent on or on this fungi and so this is the these are the four uh, types of mycorrhizal fungi and as i said we are going to and this orchid mycorrhizal fungi are also culturable we can grow that in the laboratory and uh, this second category is the one which i am going to uh, talk on and <clears throat> vesicular or vascular mycorrhizal fungi as it was called earlier and here in the top you can see this is a cross section of a non mycorrhizal root you can see the epidermis the cortex and the endodermis inside and this is the root which is colonized by the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungus the fungus lives in soil it produces very large spores called as extra matricular lamellar spores some of the spores are quite big some of them are even 450 microns which we can see even without the help of a microscope so that big as they are 
and <clears throat> and these hypha penetrate the epidermis spread on the in the cortex region it never goes it never penetrates the endodermis and goes inside so it is restricted to the cortex region and there it produces round to globo structures called as vesicles and highly branched hyphal structures called as arbuscles as two or three of the species uh, genera do not produce vesicles for example gygospora scutellospora they do not produce vesicles whereas all of them produce arbuscles and that is the reason why now the word vesicular has been removed and we call them as arbuscular or mycorrhizal fungi okay <clears throat> and these are ubiquitous that means these fungi are present everywhere in any soil whether you go to the very dry place or wet place or very cold place very hot place they are present and so you just go out and 90% of the vascular plants are colonized by this mycorrhizal fungus and so you just go out in san joseph's college outside pull out a plant bring it to the lab and stain it with tripan blue which is commonly used for staining the fungi i am 100% sure you will get the colonization by this fungus in this particular slide you are seeing the vesicles round vesicles inside so that shows that our it is just not the root it is the root fungal association <clears throat> And the arbuscles are highly branched hyphal structures. The hyphae undergoes dichotomous branching. Many times we will not be able to see this dichotomous branching very clearly, mainly because it is short lived, four to five days, and it undergoes disintegration. That is why we don't see them branching very, very clearly. And that is the structure through which the nutrients taken from the soil is released inside the plant tissue okay and these are the arbuscles <clears throat> and um, these fungi all of them belong to one particular phylum glomeromycota which has three classes of course the class of taxonomy varies and some people say only one class but it depends on how you like it but we have three classes and we have five orders, 14 families, 26 genera, and about 230 species described so far. And I said 26 genera. Of these 26 genera, four of them are very common. That means anywhere, any soil, you can find these four genera commonly. And these are the four genera. A is glomus, B is gygospora, C is Aculospora, D is Entrophospora. So these are the four genera which are very common in most of the global soils. And of these four, if a question is asked, which is the most common? Glomus is the most common. Again, if we just take the soil from St. Joseph's College, bring the soil and do the analysis in the laboratory, I am 100% sure that you will get glomus. And it is so common in Indian soils. These fungi are obligate symbionts. That means we cannot grow them in the laboratory medium as we grow other fungi, like um, as potato, dextrose, agar, zipex medium, richards medium. There are so many media for growing fungi. But these fungi cannot be grown on any of these media. They have they need the roots of a living plant to grow and multiply so that is why we maintain them as pot cultures in the glass house so each row is one particular species that's how we maintain this in my lab and so you can see these are different mycorrhizal fungi which are maintained and <clears throat> Okay, this is one of the very old slide, maybe 1970 something. Uh, still, I like it because there is a story behind it. I would like to tell this story. In 1970s, don't remember the exact year, maybe 76, I think, uh, I received a fellowship, Fulbright Fellowship, uh, to go to US and spend one year. And uh, so I was selected because it's supposed to be very prestigious and the 
problem on which I was supposed to work there was to transfer the nitrogen fixing genes from nitro nitrogen fixing bacterium to a saprophytic bacterium, Ervinia herbicola. So they said whether it goes to the saprophytic bacterium and then the saprophytic bacterium can also fix nitrogen. We, that's what they wanted to see. So I ended up with the professor, professor Martimar's lab. lab. Martimar is uh, the was the editor in chief of the annual reviews of microbiology, such a famous person. So everybody said that I'm very lucky to go to his lab. I landed up in his lab and started the work just a few days started. The next lab was working on mycorrhiza. So I used to peep into the next lab and somehow I felt the next lab work was more interesting than what I started doing. So I went to Professor Marty Marstar and then said, sir, can I shift to the mycorrhiza lab? Then he said, you have come on a Fulbright Fellowship, the office is in Washington, D.C. You call the Washington, D.C. people and if they agree and the other professor also agrees to take you, then I have no objection. So I called the lady who is in charge of the Fulbright Fellowship office and she said, we don't have any objection if the two professors have no objection. So that is how I shifted to the next lab. <coughs> And when I started working, we got, we got very good results. And it, I was working with Professor Ma, uh, John Mengi. And I still remember it was uh, December 31st when my Fulbright Fellowship was coming to an end. Sometime in October, November, Dr. John asked me, would you like to remain in California for, for another five years? We can take you on contract basis. Then uh, I was wondering whether I should continue or not. And then when I called back home, my mother and my wife, both of them said, come back. And then I talked to my Indian friends in the University of California. They all said, go back. <laughs> the reason they gave was, we are here because we didn't get a decent job in India. Whereas you are already an associate professor in a government institution. So you should go back. And we are struggling here till we find a good job. So I took their advice and they said, I'm going back. Many people said, you're a fool. And I said, no regrets. So came back. So when I came back to Bangalore and uh, told my PG student, just go and collect the plants. Let us see whether they are mycorrhiza, colonized by mycorrhiza fungi. And we found most of them were colonized by mycorrhiza fungi. This is one of the very early slides of the roots showing the vesicles inside. And many of them became world first report because in US and UK, they do not grow the crops what we grow here. Ragi, cinnamon, clove, all that became the first world first report. And <clears throat> our soils was also rich in mycorrhizal spores. We brought it and then sieved and then saw the spores and it had plenty of mycorrhizal spores. When it came back from US, uh, then Professor John Mengi said, okay, what can I give you? Then I said, I want the best culture you have. That was Globus fasciculatum. And that was the culture which they were giving to the farmers. For any avocado or orange farmer came, then that was the best culture they were giving to the farmer. So he presented me that culture. So I brought it back to India. And then we wanted to do some experiments with that particular culture. This was the first experiment we did. And this is in case of Bengal gram. And this, in this particular experiment, we used sterilized soil, autoclave soil, and got this big difference. That means in we have killed all the native endophytes, native mycorrhizal fungi we have killed. So that is why we are getting such a big difference because of inoculation with the culture what I brought from here, California. Then next question is, what type of response we will get when we inoculated the normal soil. So this is the type of response we got in case of groundnut, uninoculated versus inoculated. Still, you can see the difference in plant growth. In spite of our soils having native enterprise, the groundnut responded to inoculation with glomus fasciculatum, which I brought. And this is in case of cardamom. This is in case of neem. I just included one slide for a crop important in agriculture, one important in horticulture, one important in forestry. And we have done it with several plants, but I just included these three, which showed that 
the inoculation with an efficient strain improves the plant growth which is important in agriculture horticulture and forestry the next question is what is the mechanism by which it by which it improves plant growth and so let us take the example of cotton inoculated and inoculated we can see the difference in the dry weight so significant difference in the dry weight and you can see the difference in the phosphorus content zinc content manganese content which very very clearly show it improves the uptake of nutrients okay very clearly show the uptake of nutrients next question is what type of nutrients here we should know the soil that <coughs> then we know nitrogen phosphorus and potassium are three major plant nutrients and there are some nutrients which move very freely in the soil solution and come to the root hair zone and which the root hairs take the nutrient uh, the nutrient but there are some nutrients which do not move freely in soil solution which we call the must eat nutrients or diffusion limited nutrients so they are present in soil but they do not move freely in soil so phosphorus is a huge or a immobile nutrient so let us see this better picture this is the plant root and root hairs and we know root hairs nutrients are taken by the root hairs so all the available phosphorus that is present in this region root hair region has been taken by the root hairs there is no more phosphorus left here we call this as p depletion zone there is no more phosphorus all the phosphorus has been taken by the root hair but here the mycorrhizal fungus plays the most important role because the hyphae of amphigae they travel much longer distance compared to root hair scavenge a larger volume of soil take the phosphorus which is away from the root hair region pump it directly into the plant okay so thereby short circuiting the nutrient so this is true not only for phosphorus it is true for other diffusion limited nutrients like zinc copper etc okay so this is where the mycorrhizal fungus helps in the uptake of diffusion limited nutrients and being a microbiology lab we were interested in seeing the interaction between the mycorrhizal fungus and the nitrogen fixing bacterium rhizobium japonicum here again i would like to say that most of the mycorrhiza workers were very happy with pot culture experiments but this is this was one of the very early field experiment that was done and interaction between rhizobium and glomus fasciculatum in soya bean and we had a soya bean scheme in the university that is how we could collaborate with them and do this experiment and what we, what is what came out of this experiment we inoculated in one treatment inoculated with only mycorrhizal fungus another treatment only with rhizobium and the treatment it was a dual inoculation with both the organisms and of course there was a control and what we could see is, is there was a synergistic interaction between the two organisms the mycorrhizal fungus increasing nodulation and nitrogen fixation by soya bean and the rhizobium increasing the colonization and pea uptake by the mycorrhizal fungus and thereby increasing the plant growth increasing the mycorrhizal colonization in dual inoculation you have more mycorrhizal colonization compared to only mycorrhiza and rhizobium number of nodules you can see only rhizobium 240 here it is 410 and same thing was true for uh, dry weight of the plant and the grain yield which is the most important parameter and dual inoculation gave the highest grain yield so we could see that there is a synergistic interaction between the mycorrhizal fungus and the nitrogen fixing bacterium and this was true for for even a free living nitrogen fixing bacterium astrobacter and this was done in tomato again a synergistic interaction between the two and the dual inoculation increasing the, the yield of the plant compared to single inoculation and, and we also did some experiment with the interaction between the mycorrhizal fungus and the phosphate solubilizing bacteria and here again i have to mention that there was a controversy amongst the mycorrhiza workers some believed that almost 50% of them believed that mycorrhizal fungi 
can solubilize unavailable form of phosphorus in soil and 50 percent did not uh, did not pr uh, present uh, believe this so we did this particular experiment and then what we did was when we again there was a synergistic interaction between the two so and we used tricalcium phosphate the p32 labeled tricalcium phosphate and showed convincingly that mycorrhizal fungi do not solubilize unavailable form of in p in that is present in soil so this again was a very breakthrough and um, secondly uh, we showed that that there is a synergistic interaction between the two that means suppose a farmer uses rock phosphate which is unavailable form of phosphorus and the phosphate solubilizing organism act on this and release the phosphate ion and this phosphate ion is taken by the mycorrhizal fungus so there is a synergistic interaction then we inoculate with the mycorrhizal fungus and the phosphate solubilizing organism thereby dual inoculation is beneficial compared to single inoculation and another thing which we looked for was the the interaction between a plant pathogen and the mycorrhizal fungus again this was one of the first a very early experiment done by my first PhD student, Krishna, who joined as a microbiologist at ITRISAT in Hyderabad, an international institution. And um, so here we could see that the sclerotium, this particular thing is a uh, groundnut plant is infected with the pathogen sclerotium rhodesi. You can see the diseased plant. Here we have introduced the same amount of pathogen plus the mycorrhizal fungus. You can see the difference between the two, which very, very clearly showed the mycorrhizal fungus helps in alleviating the disease caused by the pathogen. So what is the reason? Again, we were wondering how, how to go about doing it. Finally, we did some biochemical analysis and found that the roots of the mycorrhizal plants had higher concentration of orthodihydroxyphenols, which inhibited the germination of the sclerotium of the pathogen, sclerotium rhodesi. And that is how it is protecting the plants against the disease. And next thing is, in and around Bangalore, root knot nematode is a very serious problem in solanaceous crops. So this is the matter root. You can see that the tertiary galls, which are quite quite big caused by the root knot nematode, melodic and incognito. And here, when, here is the right side, we have, we have introduced the same number of the larvae of the nematode plus the mycorrhizal fungal inoculation. And here, we ended up with seeing very small galls, which are called as primary galls, and uh, it, which did not develop into secondary and tertiary galls. And we were wondering how to interpret this result. So we had discussion with the nematologists and went through the literature and finally came to know this, that mycorrhizal fungus is not preventing the penetration into the root system. If it would have penetrated, if it would have prevented the penetration, primary gods would not have formed. So that primary god, presence of primary gods shows that the nematode larvae has penetrated the nematode roots and form the small galls. But what did it prevent? The mycorrhizal fungus has prevented the development of the larva of the nematode into adult. And thereby, we don't have the secondary and tertiary galls. So, this uh, other nematology scientists also agreed for this. And going to the literature, we found that if the sulfur containing amino acids prevent the development of nematode into adult, so we looked into the root system and for the sulfur containing amino acids and we found that mycorrhizal fungus has a higher concentration of sulfur containing amino acids. So which showed the mechanism by which it's protecting the roots from the rheumatoid attack. And here I have just given up, given in a in summary what are the various mechanisms by which the mycorrhizal fungi can improve plant growth. Number one is through increased uptake of nutrients, mainly the diffusion limited nutrients. Second is the synergistic interaction with beneficial soil organisms like nitrogen fixing organisms, phosphate solubilizing organisms, PGPRs, and so on. 
and third one is protecting the plants against soil borne plant pathogens mainly soil borne plant pathogens both fungi bacteria and nematodes it protects the plants against the soil borne plant pathogen it also protects the plants against mild drought not very severe drought but mild drought and this we had a project funded by icr which we completed very recently where we have shown inoculation with the mycorrhizal fungus protected the soybean plants against drought this as this is done in the field conditions and shown that in, without any doubt that it protects the plants against water stress and also it produces the growth promoting substances like indolastic acid gibberellic acid cytokinins so it is a cumulative effect of all these that makes the plants to grow better and here is another hypothesis which i would like to introduce and here is the lucina lucasifera plant which, which was introduced few decades back as a wonder plant by americans actually it was it spread to almost all the countries including india and because every part of the plant can be used in one way or the other that's why it was called as a wonder plant and here we were one of the student was trying inoculation with different species of mycorrhizal fungi and what was the hypothesis that was given by the uk scientist and the american scientist only the two groups which are dominating on mycorrhizal research and they said the mycorrhizal fungi are not host specific okay so even today that statement is correct they are not host specific if you take it from tobacco and try to put it on banana it will colonize banana take it from banana and put it on tomato it will colonize tomato or put it on wheat it will colonize wheat so that means there is no host specificity but in this experiment what we could conclude the first one is control this is a different mycorrhizal fungi and the host is the same lucida lucasifera what we said is though there is no host specificity there is host preference so a new hypothesis we proposed there is host preference in mycorrhizal fungi that means this is the best fungus for inoculating lucida lucasifera lucasifera thereby we can screen various mycorrhizal fungi and select the one which is best for inoculating a particular crop if suppose your crop of interest is tomato you can screen various mycorrhizal fungi and select the one which is best for inoculating tomato which the americans and british people did not accept so uh, next one we had to do this exercise in uh, other ex other crops this is in case of cashew again we said the last one is the best mycorrhizal fungus for inoculating cashew and here you can say the one the third one is the best for inoculating citrus rootstock with all these somehow i think they were convinced to some extent and it worked out to our my advantage that the united states department of agriculture came out with a big funding to the university of agricultural sciences bangalore they said we are giving you so many dollars and if your hypothesis is correct we what we want is at the end of fifth year it was a five year project at the end of five year we want one culture mycorrhizal culture which the forest nursery men can inoculate those in a locus apella okay so we started doing this. and this is what came out of the fifth year after five years research and lucina lucasifera there are four cultivars of lucina lucasifera which is commonly grown in karnataka state and so we wanted to select a mycorrhizal fungus which works on all the four cultivars because one farmer may be or a forest nursery man may be growing this other fellow may be growing other one we can't be giving different cultures for different cultivars so we said wanted to select one cultivar which works on most of the cultivars of lucas and apelus in a lucas apella so this particular fungus was glomus mossiae which was found to be the best working on all the four cultivars and this is difference in the root system which you can see and such nice differences these are the four cultivars k8 k28 k67 k72 k stands for karnataka karnataka 7 this is given by the forest department 
So this particular work, when we were doing this, and we also in agricultural universities, we have Krishi Mela, that is where we have to meet the farmers. Once a year, uh, we have this Krishi Mela, the farmers come and we explain what we have done. And uh, so we have to answer the farmers if they have any doubts. Okay. I, it's my personal experience, I tell you, it's much easier to, uh, to answer the questions raised by scientists and students, but much more difficult to answer the questions raised by farmers because they ask such intelligent questions. So the Krishi Mela came and uh, I told Glomus Mossier is the best fungus for inoculating Lucina locusapella. The farmer, one farmer stood up and asked, which is the next best fungus, which I never expected. So anyway, I told him, Gaikas Pura Margarita is the next best fungus. And he, another question came from him, what will happen if I mix both these fungi and inoculate? So I said, sorry, I can't answer your question because we are not done such experiments. You please come next year and I will do this experiment and give you the answer. So we did this experiment. I tell you there was no adverse effect by mixing these two organisms. Perhaps there could be advantages if one fungus doesn't work in one soil, the other fungus can take over and work. So it probably it may be advantages if we mix two effective fungi and inoculate a particular crop. And <clears throat> And uh, before this, I would like to tell one more thing that is, uh, yeah. And here, all the plants are not equally dependent on mycorrhizal fungi. Some fungi are more dependent, some less dependent, some not at all dependent. So there is a classification to what extent the plant is dependent on mycorrhizal fungi, which we call as relative mycorrhizal dependency of the plant. So if it, it's a very simple way of finding out uh, the relative mycorrhizal dependency of a plant. What we do is dry weight of the plant in unsterile soil, dry weight of the plant in sterile soil, divided by dry weight of the plant in unsterile soil multiplied by 100. This formula gives the relative mycorrhizal dependency of the plant. So based on this formula, we have categorized the important crop plants which are grown in Karnataka into four categories, which are highly dependent, uh, moderately dependent, less dependent, and not dependent. So when we have also said, initially, we will work only on the crops which are highly dependent on mycorrhizal fungi. So when this type of work was going on, and the department, uh, the director general of uh, IC, uh, ICFRE, that is the Indian Council of Forestry Research and Education from Dehradun visited the university. And the, usually the vice chancellor of the university brings all the important visitors only to two departments, and that is physiology and microbiology. So he brought the visitor to the microbiology and I took the director general to the glass house and showed him the difference in Lucina leucocephala due to inoculation with the mycorrhizal fungus. And he said, are you sure it is only because of inoculation? I said, sir, it is only because of inoculation. Then he said, if your fungus can bring this much difference, I want such a thing to be done for other forestry species. So a big project again came from ICFRE, where he wanted that we should develop the best mycorrhizal fungus for inoculating various forest tree species. I just included one picture, Tectona grandis. You can see the difference in plant growth such a beautiful difference and there was a lot of demand for this particular fungus. And these are the various forestry species. Uh, of course, there are more, but I just included some of them where we have included, selected the best mycorrhizal fungus for Acacia nilotica, Auriculiformis, Holocerisia, Albizia lebec, Azadi recta, Caliandra, Casuarina equisitifolia, Dalbergia sisu, the Albergia latifolia, Tamarindus, Tiptona grandis, and so on. So this was given to the ICFRE, and some many of them, and including the Karnataka Forest Department, they have been they have been using this for inoculating in the forest nurseries. 
At this time, the horticulture department again came forward with the funding. They said, we want such studies to be done for horticultural crops. So good. I think I was very lucky. My students were lucky. We got projects after projects. So, so we could get lots of uh, funding and we could develop the best mycorrhizal fungus for inocting tomato, capsicum, chili, coffee, cardamom, and including the flowering plants like marigold, chrysanthemum, rosemary, and so on. And this time the National Medicinal Plants Board came and they said, we want the best fungus for inoculating various medicinal and aromatic plants. So we developed it for them for various plants like Andrographis, Coleus aromaticus, Coleus forcefully, Philanthus summerus, Piper longum, Saraka asoka, and Vitania somnifera, and few more. And so, <clears throat> okay, the next question that was asked is, having selected the best fungus, how it is going to be useful to the end user? Okay, what is the practical use? Is it just only increasing the yield on growth or anything else? So for this, to answer this question, we developed phosphate response curves, where in the x-axis, we have the increasing level of phosphatic fertilizer, and in the y-axis, we have the plant biomass. And here, this is a mycorrhizal plant and the non-mycorrhizal plant of the same species. So this non-mycorrhizal plant, to produce this amount of biomass, how much of phosphatic fertilizer it requires, let us say 70 kg. And the mycorrhizal plant, to produce the same amount of fertilizer, how much of phosphatic fertilizer it requires, let us say 50 kg. That means we are saving 20 kg of phosphatic fertilizer through inoculation with the selected mycorrhizal fungus. So this is the one which really caught the impression of various funding agencies. They were so much impressed and we have taken it to the field and shown it in many crop plants. I have just included one crop plant here. This is in case of chili. The recommended level of phosphatic fertilizer for chili is 75 kgp per hectare. With the uninoculated plant, the amount we given the full recommended level of phosphatic fertilizer. This is the yield we are getting. Okay, 1.81 kg per plot. It's a field experiment. Again, we are inoculating with the various mycorrhizal fungi. With this particular mycorrhizal fungus, we are getting 2.14 with 50% of the recommended phosphatic fertilizer, which very, very clearly show that 50% of the recommended phosphatic fertilizer can be saved through inoculation with the selected microbial fungus. This we have done it with uh, various crop plants and then shown which convinced and that is how mycorrhizal research became the first area of research by various funding agencies in the country. And now we talk of high tech, everything is high tech and we talk of high tech agriculture also where the farmers do not raise their own seedlings. I'm sure that this is common in many places but this is very common in and around Bangalore. The farmers do not raise their own seedlings. They just go to a nursery person, nursery man, and buy the seedlings. And so the nursery man raises it, raises it in pro tray or uh, trailers like this, and then root trailers, and then the farm buys the seedling. And <clears throat> here it's very, very easy to apply the mycorrhizal inoculum. Mix it with the substrate, the farmer plants it in the field, the fungus goes automatically to the field. Very simple technology. So this is a close-up. So the, the roots are colonized by the mycorrhizal fungus because the substrate has been inoculated with the mycorrhizal fungus. At this time, <clears throat> the Indian Council of Agricultural Research came with another problem. The problem was that in case of citrus rootstocks, the rootstocks remain in the nursery for nearly 24 months, two years before, because it has to reach the pencil thickness. The stem has to reach the pencil thickness. Then only it is ready for grafting. Okay. So ICR said, again, we are giving a project. See that whether the mycorrhizal fungus can reduce this length of time. 24 months. So we tried various mycorrhizal fungi 
and uninoculated control various mycorrhizal fungi you can see with this particular fungus this was the increase in the stem diameter so this stem diameter we could re 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 receive or it could re the plant could reach in 18 months instead of 24 months so there was six months saving of the plant sitting in the nursery bed which is an excellent contribution which the citric culture is accepted it and now uh, the citric culture association in goni Kopal at present in karnataka follows this as a practice in the nursery and this is followed by some other uh, citric culture is also and you know in and around bangalore lot of floriculture floriculture is a very important industry in and around bangalore and in fact it is said that uh, a flight load of flowers go to Amsterdam. Earlier it was every day. Now after COVID, there is a problem. And um, so that to that extent, it's a business. And so these floricultures came to us. And then they said, well, how mycorrhizal fungus will help us? And here, this is, I we have done it with various flowering plants. I've just included one. This is chrysanthemum, uninoculated versus inoculated. You can see the increase in the number of flowers. But another thing I should tell here, the inoculated plants flowered three weeks early. The floriculturists were more impressed by that. They said if it is simply flowering early, that is a more interesting thing for us. Of course, the increased number of flowers also is equally important. So this is again a, a, a practice which is followed by floriculturists. Another thing is at this time, the post harvest technology department in the university, they came to me and they said, we want to cut these flowers and put it in the flower vase and then see whether the mycorrhizal plant flowers result for a longer time. So I was very happy when they said this. And after a few days, they came back and they said, your mycorrhizal plants were looking fresh three days more compared to non-mycorrhizal plants. Okay. So this this type such type of report has come from other countries and now we know that is because of the reduced ethylene production in the mycorrhizal plants that is how the vast life gets increased and this particular report did not come from us this ethylene report came from thailand okay then at this time icr again came to us this the thing is in case of cashew, there is another problem. If there is the farmers raise it in uh, polythene bags and they plant it in the field. So what happens is then there, there is a transplant transplant shock. When the farmer plants hundred seedlings in the field, forty of them die. Forty percent mortality. That is a transplant shock because the cashew does not withstand transplant shock. So ICR again came with a project and they said whether we mycorrhiza can help this. And we this, did this all these experiments in a cashew research station uh, called Ullal, which is very close to Mangalore. And this is the result of the three years project. And when it is the seedlings are inoculated with these two fungi, Achillospora levis and Blomus etonicatum, the survival in the field when they were transplanted was 100%. When they are inoculated, it was survival was only 63%. Again, the cashew nursery men followed this particular technology for raising and transplant uh, for raising the seedlings. At this time, the tissue culture people came to us how the tissue culture plants will respond to mycorrhizal inoculation. This is tissue cultured uh, uh, banana, and we inoculated it at the time of uh, uh, what is this? Transplant, not transplanting. What is that stage? I'm not getting the name. So then we can see the difference in the trans in the difference in the growth of these plants, uh, which very, very clearly shows that tissue cultured plants also get the benefit of inoculation with at the, at the time of hardening. Sorry, now I got it. At the time of hardening, it has to be inoculated. We get this type of uh, differences. And what you are seeing here is again another tissue cultured plant 
called ficus benjamina and here why we took this particular plant is that this is the plant that is recommended for planting in where there are double roads in the middle of the road this is the plant that is recommended for planting in bangalore and because it can uh, tolerate lot of pollution and so that's why we worked on this and you can see the first part it is inoculated only with mycorrhizal fungus and here inoculated with a consortium of micro microorganisms the same mycorrhizal fungus along with the mycorrhiza helper bacterium and the biocontrol agent trichotherma arzianum so if we compare these two it's very very clear the consortium is much better compared to inoculation with the mycorrhizal fungus alone so now onwards we have started working on microbial consortium rather than individually working on mycorrhizal fungus <clears throat> so you can see here another consortium uninoculated acacia nilatica uh, sorry acacia auriculiformis and inoculated with mycorrhizal fungus alone inoculated with the microbial consortium and this is our dbt funded project which we completed about 2 years back where the game they wanted us to develop a uh, mycel consortium and in case of tomato and capsicum there is a wilt disease complex which is very very serious in and around bangalore very serious and it is not caused by one pathogen it is caused by a fungal pathogen physarium and it is in your source by a bacterial pathogen ralstonia solanaceum and a nematode pathogen merida gen javanica so three pathogens so that is why we call it as wilt disease complex so if something can take care of the fungal pathogen bacterial pathogen nematode pathogen naturally we should go for a consortium so that is how we developed this consortium and you can see the seedlings raised in protrase and we have developed one mycorrhizal fungus one pgpr pseudomonas florescens and one fungus uh, one bacterium which can take off uh, which one uh, microbe which can take care of the nematode pseudomonas lilacinus so this consortium you can see the difference in the plant and this again a practice followed by the nursery men and some of the the in case of capsicum what will happen if it's not to grow in protrase suppose a farmer grows raises it uh, in uh, nursery bed in his farm again you can see the difference so even when it is raised in nursery beds this is the type of difference we will get of course in case of capsicum the fungal pathogen is not uh, the physarium it is pythium and you can see the difference root region also a well developed root system a root system which can establish better and this is a work of one of the phd student and she worked on pacholi uh, which is an aromatic crop plant and uh, this is uh, a plant which is of interest to industry because a perfume or the scent what we use is prepared from this particular plant and so the the industry is interested with the buyback arrangement which we are growing this uh, large scale and so this student worked on developing a microbial consortium for pacholi and you can see the difference in the growth of pacholi in polyplant of course later we have taken it to the field also and the smell of it is so good and whenever the student she used to harvest the plant and then keep it in the lab for shade drying for before uh, extracting the essential oil the whole building i am not talking over my lab the whole building will smell so good everybody used to come to my lab and then ask what you are doing in your lab so that is the smell aroma of this particular plant and uh, some uh, <coughs> little more, more i said from this plant what is important for the industry is the oil content from which they prepare the perfume so with the recommended level of nitrogen n p and k what is the amount of oil they are getting 2.92 with 50% of nitrogen and phosphorus reduced and of course we have given full k see the amount of and the microbial consortium 
we get 3.66. This is what the industry is interested in because it will be used for, for the extraction of the perfume. Another crop which was introduced uh, with the buyback arrangement with the pharmaceutical companies is the medicinal plant Coleus forscoli. Coleus forscoli was introduced in three states. It was introduced in Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. And people, the farmers were so happy to grow this plant because there is a buyback arrangement. But I have seen some farmers crying and coming and then said, this crop is diseased by a pathogen. And what was the disease? Again, wilt disease is caused by physarium, which was so drastic. You can see the disease index is 85%. So they were actually crying and they said something can be done to control this disease. When we inoculated, this was a field experiment that was done in a place called Kollegal in the border between Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. And with the only the mycorrhizal fungus, the disease index came to 68. But when we developed a consortium with the biocontrol agent trichoderma, it came down to 33. So now this is again a practice which is commonly followed by the farmers raising this medicinal plant. At this time, DBT came with another project. They said, uh, mycorrhizal fungus being an obligate symbiont, it cannot be, it's not that easy to mass multiply. What we want is some method by which it can be mass multiplied by the industry, by commercialized and in a short time, okay, industrialized with maximum number of infective produce in a short time. So that is how we developed the best, we tried and developed the best uh, host the best substrate, the best nutrient solution, the best time to harvest the plant, and the, the amount of fungicides or uh, insecticide that can be added without killing the mycorrhizal fungus, which will take care of the pathogens. And all this has been standardized. And this protocol is followed by uh, four industries in India, two in Tamil Nadu, one in Gujarat, and one in Hyderabad and one in outside India, one in Malaysia, and one in Vietnam. When you have Vietnam, we think very shortly it's going or it is being followed. So this is uh, the thing which we have given to the industry. And at that time, uh, another thing which we wanted to see, where to place the inoculum, going through the literature, world literature, there was no information available where to place the inoculum to get the best result. And so he said, how can people ignore this? So we started doing this, those, though we thought it is silly to do it, but we thought we should do it. So in case of raised nursery bed, placing the inoculum two centimeters below the seed is the best to give the best plant growth response. And in case of uh, polybags, keeping the, placing the inoculum six centimeters below the seed gives the best result. And uh, so such simple things also, I don't know how people have not done it. So anyway, we had a chance to do it. And the amount of inoculum needed, earlier we thought one kg of inoculum per meter square is the best, but now we say even 500 grams per meter square is the best. And another Krishi Mela came. Okay, we have to face the farmer. And one farmer raised and said, it is good. We have many good things we have heard about mycorrhiza, but I have a 10 year old mulberry garden. Such an old plant can I inoculate with mycorrhiza? Will I get increased, increased leaf yield? Because mulberry is grown for its leaf. So, again, I have to say him, we have not done such experiments. We will do it for you. Please come next year. Fortunately, our sericulture department had a 10 year old mulberry garden and where we had inoculated with the mycorrhizal fungus. And we could see that when the mycorrhizal fungus is inoculated to such old plants at the root zone, again, we get increased yield with 50% reduction of the phosphatic fertilizer. And it so happened, the planning commission invited me as a special invitee for some reason. 
and they said we heard about the mycorrhiza research what is going on in your university but don't tell us anything science but what we want is economics and so present us the economics so it i was a bit scary to present it before all bureaucrats all ias officers so anyway we had prepared this particular chart and for the economics of tobacco inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi and this is the yield of uninoculated tomato given 100% of phosphatic fertilizer the farmer would get 9000 kg per acre and with 50% reduced you know phosphatic fertilizer and inoculation with the best mycorrhizal fungus he will get 10400 kg that means he is getting 1400 kg extra yield so yield and the and the thing is the price of tomato varies very much in bangalore sometimes it comes to 2 rupees sometimes it goes to 100 rupees so i have taken 25 rupees per kg of tomato and so 1400 into 25 he will get 35000 rupees more and he has saved phosphatic fertilizer 50% and he will get this much so per acre he will be getting an extra income of 36875 i think this convinced the bureaucrats and uh, so anyway we have a good chance to continue with the mycorrhiza research so at that time it was almost uh, 2000 year year 2000 and i was to retire from the university and um, one of the committee a dst committee i was the expert committee member and they one of the come a dst person asked me what you are going to do after retirement then i said i will continue in the university as emeritus professor no problem then he said that is okay that you continue but regarding your mycorrhiza research you should go in the same trend as it is going now so for that what can, what can i do i asked him then he said start a trust okay and then do this only soil microbiology research okay don't do anything no business do only microbiology research so that is how we had a trust which is now called center for natural biological resources and community development and we continued the research and again the first project was given by dst and when we started this uh, trust in 2000 there is a condition that uh, the trust must be 3 years old before any project can be given that is the government of government rules and uh, but they waived off the rule and then since you are a committee member we are giving giving you a project in the first year itself that is how this project came and the project was very interesting the question asked by dst is you have shown such wonderful results with mycorrhizal inoculation with your phd students work and how many plants have they used 100 inoculated 100 uninoculated and such, such beautiful differences suppose a forest nursery man raises thousands of seedlings will he get the same amount of response i said i do not know then they said this project is given for that <laughs> okay so what we want is 3000 seedlings 3000 seedlings i was scared one seed one research fellow this poor boy at that time now he is associate professor of forestry and um, so then the karnataka forest department said do not worry accept the project we will give you as many labor you want 30 40 we will give you but we want to see how the technology works in a large scale so that is how it was done in a place called mandya in between bangalore and mysore with three forestry species and this is the result you can see tectona grandis dalbergia sissu and acacia aquilifera you can see the difference between noted that my students have done an excellent job what happened in 500 seedlings in the lab worked very well even with 1000 seedlings in the forest nursery men and there is a, a degraded forest in the area where we were doing this experiment and the forest department said why not we plant it in the degraded forest and see how it grows 
so it was difficult to again they said don't worry about labor because of the slope of the hill and we will give you as much so we planted it there you can see the degraded forest the soil is so we planted it there this is one year old uh, tectona grandis and this is one year old acacia auriculiformis and i wanted to see the one at the bottom and this is dalbert Sisu, which gave us the best result and this is the forest person and you can see this is uninoculated plant he looks big this is inoculum small the reason is the plant tree is much bigger it is almost inoculated where this the size of uninoculated plants this is after 52 months after two months after planting so the dst person one doctor vinitha sharma she visited us i took her just so simple should go to all the other states so she wants me to extend it but very difficult to do it uh, uh no time <laughs> and given for the forest nursery men and farmers who periodically visit us we are at the time of independence because there was not enough food to be feed the people we were eagerly wait for the ship to correct it ship to mouth existed because when wheat came people got the wheat ground it made chapatis and eat it thanks to green revolution high yielding varieties were introduced and we the the crop yield just went up in just few years because of green revolution but one thing happened we were very happy we had enough food to eat but what bad thing happened for raising such high high yielding varieties we have to use heavy doses of fertilizers and pesticides we never bothered about it initially but now after so many decades we are concerned about it because now we know that, that they are deleted in animal and human health we have nitrate in the soil much beyond the recommended level and even the tender coat of the pesticide now we are concerned about the environment so because of this organic farming or sustainable agriculture is being introduced all of that of this program and now one particular state to begin with that is sikkim is 100% not use any chemicals or and it will be extended to other states in the course of time so what is recommended in organic agriculture and more biologicals when we talk of more biologicals it could be green manure plant it could be corn here the mycorrhizal fungi and other microbial inoculants play a very very important role more than that they are much cheaper they are cost effective compared to a chemical fertilizer or pesticide these biological things keep soil health natural and human health also improves so these biologicals are a boon to farm especially in developing country like ours thank you very much and again if you have any questions i will be happy to answer good thank you thank you for your thank you sir thank you for your excellent presentation thank you if participants if you have any queries or questions you can ask through chat box
So for the previous uh, session, uh, so one uh, uh, participant asked for this question. Yeah. Yeah. So only one question posted by Sahana was Khan. Uh -huh. Question is what are misophon? What are misophon? We yes. gave the examples no and misana. It is depends on the fauna, which depends on the size. So we have included nematodes and all those, no, tardigrades, all these. These are mesophana. Yes. It just you know, the category classification is based on the size of the organism. Macrophana are bigger, like earworms, snails, beetles. Mesophana are the ones which are smaller than that. Okay, thank you. Hope uh, Dr. Sahana was uh, uh, got the question answered from uh, our resource person. If uh, there is uh, no question, we will uh, break this uh, session for lunch so after lunch the second session third session will be started uh, uh, sharply by two o'clock so dear participants so for these uh, sessions uh, first and second sessions we have uh, posted the feedback uh, in the youtube, YouTube chat box so please uh, your feedback friends also yeah, we also posted the link for the next session. So there is a separate link for the afternoon session. So that is uh, posted in your uh, chat box. Please uh, make use of that uh, link for entering in the uh, YouTube. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Please join with us sharply. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yes. Francis. So nice <laughs> to see you and interact. Nice. Yeah. Okay, bye. bye.